when I was like 19 years old, I decided, hey, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 40. I had no idea really what that meant. I just knew that a million dollars was a lot of money. And 40 seemed like really old at the time. And I didn't know anybody that was young and had a lot of money. So I thought, okay, I, I can be can be old and have a lot of money. So that was the goal. Thank you for joining me on the Investing for Freedom podcast. Today, I'm actually super excited about this episode. And if you're a listener to the show, then you know I am a huge fan of community. And this is going to be a great example why. When you find a community that is truly vetted, whatever that means, um, you tend to align with people. And you don't even have to really have a one-year or five-year or 10-year relationship with them. You just know that based on the pillars of a community, that they're good people. And you guys often hear me talk about GoBundance. I'm fully convinced at this stage, just because of how focused GoBundance is on the pillars in GoBundance and the type of people that are attracted, I could pretty much go into any city and say, who's in GoBundance and have an amazing conversation. And Alan Underwood, who's on the show today, um, we don't know each other that well, but we're part of the same community. And as you really get to talking, life's not that complicated. There's so many things that we have in common when you really get down to it, if you're really clear on what your values are and what you value, and you find a community around that, the chances of building deep, authentic relationships, which is one of the main pillars of GoBundance, is pretty aware and pretty powerful. So Alan, I'm excited to get into the conversation today. We're going to talk about a bunch of different stuff, but thanks for coming on the show, man. Thanks for having me, Mike. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, it's going to be super fun. And you had originally reached out and mentioned that you were starting a podcast called Plane Success, which I'll, I'll I'll throw out there just right at the beginning. I'm a pilot, you're a pilot. And anytime you can talk to another pilot about airplanes, it just is intriguing. And so I said, hey, happy to be on your podcast. Would love to have you on mine. Um, but before we get into any of that, I want to ask you a couple of questions. If you could narrow it down to one thing that has had the greatest impact on your success, what do you think that would be? Um, well, you said it at the beginning, it would be community. So. I joined GoBundance a little over a year ago, and that above and beyond anything else in, in my life, it took me 42 years to figure that out, <laughs> but, but, um, but that has been the biggest influence uh, for success. And I'm not really defining that as financial success. That's really life success, uh, health, fitness, family finance, it, it's touched everything in a really powerful way. Yeah. And that's what I love about the pillars of GoBundance because, you know, everybody that's in GoBundance is successful because there's a barrier to entry, obviously. But this is not one of those communities. And I'm not putting any other community down, but this isn't like a, you know, a Tiger 21 or a YPO or anything like that where, you know, yeah, you've got this barrier to entry and the main thing is about business and success and money. It's all these other pillars. Like I said, authentic relationships, the bucket list adventures, the extreme accountability, um, that's just what I've found so amazing. And in this day and age, with everything that has changed in our country the last even 50 years, I think that's what makes GoBundance so powerful because it allows us to reconnect to, you know, I think in, I, I think men in general have a hard time being open and authentic and and having these real conversations. And yeah, we get to talk about money and airplanes and business and investing and funds and all that stuff. But it's like all the other things, when we break through the barrier, uh, and and become authentic and can be real and vulnerable, like that's the thing that I think we're really missing out as uh, as men in the world today. Yeah, and I'll I'll maybe frame that response of community um, with really the importance behind that. And I think it's love for self and love for other people that really motivate success. And that's I think where my biggest growth has been within the GoBundance community is. Um, in fact, at the, the last event in, in Atlanta, there was a guest at one of the tables who said they were excited to be there to talk about business. And somebody else at the table said, well, I think you're going to be pretty disappointed then because I, that's not why we show up. That's We've got a community of like-minded people that we can enjoy life with, that we can be really vulnerable with, that help us to see the best within us. And who then we can shine that light back at them and help them see the best that's within them as well. And I think love for yourself and other people leads to happiness. And then when you're a genuinely happy, loving person and success flows from that, that's, that's my belief. Yeah. So good. You know, on that thread, since you brought it up, 
Um, I was going to bring this up a little bit later in the episode, but when you bring up like the giving and, you know, one of the pillars is genuine contribution and go abundance. Um, what I love, and there's this idea and most of our audience wouldn't fall into this category, but there's an idea that's still pretty, it's a plague out there really that, you know, successful people are, you know, stingy and, and they're just focused on money and all this stuff. And I've found the opposite, man, every single person that I've met in go abundance, which again, there's a barrier to entry. So by nature, most of the guys are pretty successful are very, very, very giving people. And one of the things that I want to kind of touch on, you're again, a pilot and you love flight and we'll get into plane success and your podcast and all of that. Um, I, I have to be careful not to just geek out on, you know, being a pilot for an hour because, because <laughs> it's really easy to do, but you're part of an organization called Angel Flight West. And so in the, in the vein of contribution, why don't you share a little bit about that with us? Cause it's pretty cool um, I don't know a ton about it, but I get the concept and there's other organizations like it. So why don't you share what that organization is and why you're so passionate about it? Yeah, well, the short answer is that organization was part of bringing me back to life out of one of the most difficult periods of my life. And so was aviation. So, you know, to provide context so that it's really a easy to understand why this is all so important and so near and dear to my heart is... Uh, so my family went through a series of just really difficult things. 2016, my youngest daughter was born with a serious birth defect. And we didn't know uh, if she was going to survive. Uh, we were in the NICU with her for six weeks. She underwent several surgeries. And thankfully, and I really feel like there were very direct uh, divine intervention and blessings that allowed her to survive that situation. But that was stressful for our family. Um, she didn't sleep through the night for the next couple of years. I don't know if that was because of the medication or just her body, you know, being unhealthy or what. So my wife and I are now sleep deprived. We've gone through this stressful situation. 2018, we find out that her mom has cancer and a week later, her mom passes away. She was my wife's best friend. They, they lived a mile away, Mike. We, they walked, my wife and she walked together every morning. They talked about everything. Um, 13 months after that, my father-in-law's cancer came back and he passed away. And then 13 months after that, my dad had a massive stroke and passed away. Wow. And so in the, within the period of two years, we lost three parents. And my dad's loss was particularly hard for me. He, I'd been business partners with my dad since I was 21 years old. So wow. we literally had shared an office for the last 13 years of his life and it was during covid and so we weren't even allowed to be in the hospital with him as he passed well wow. and those three things together put me into a very deep depression um and to the point where I, I have a note card still in my office where i wrote down that there are three miracles that i need from god i need the miracle of happiness I need the miracle of prosperity, and I need the miracle of purpose. I walked away from a $16 million a year business during that time period. I literally gave it away just because I was so wrecked that I couldn't run it anymore. And those three things became the sole purpose and focus of my life is figuring out how can I be happy again. Um, I had always wanted to fly. Um, since my, my grandfather was a master sergeant in the Air Force, I can remember going to Luke Air Force Base as a little kid and him showing me the F-16s he was working on. And uh, I went to air shows. I There's a playground next to Falcon Field in Mesa, Arizona, where I would take my kids to play as they were growing up so I could watch the planes take off and land. And I had just never given myself permission to do it. And um, one of the things that came to me as I was praying and meditating on how can I be happy was go take a flight lesson. And Mike, I'll never forget the first lesson. Uh, when that plane took off, it literally felt like my spirit soared and all of the challenges that I was facing stayed on the ground. And I walked back in the door of my house from that first lesson. I didn't even say anything. My wife took one look at me and she goes, oh, you found your thing today, didn't you? You could just see it. And because I had walked away from a business, I considered myself at that point gainfully unemployed. Um, thankfully, we had resources that could provide for us while I was figuring life out. But I, I took that first lesson and I bought an airplane. And then I spent pretty much every day of the next year 
went from never having flown a plane to commercially rated pilot. Um, and in that process, I thought there's got to be some other people that this feeling can help. And so I just started Googling aviation charities. And that's where I came across Angel Flight West. I signed up. And I'll never forget my first flight. So Angel Flight West does free flights for people in need of medical care far from home. Cancer patients, burn survivors, kids needing organ transplants. We also do flights for veterans and active duty military personnel. We do free flights for victims of domestic violence and abuse to help them get away from the people that are hurting them. And all of that is free. The pilots donate their plane, donate their time, pay for the fuel, and provide that service for people. My first flight was a young man whose name is Bradley. Uh, at the time, he was 18 years old. When he was 15, he was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. His family lived about six hours away from Phoenix Children's Hospital. And three times a week, his mom would drive him into Phoenix Children's Hospital. They'd be there all day for his appointments, and she'd drive home. You can imagine what that does to a family's finances, to her health, to their emotional state, to his recovery. Then they discovered Angel Flight West. Uh, my flight with Bradley was an hour and 15 minutes. Pick him up. We have him there for his appointment in the morning. He's back home by lunchtime. It is literally a life-changing service. And there's no limit to the number of flights people can do. There's people that we've been flying for 20 years that we've done hundreds of flights for them. We just passed our 100,000th flight as an organization. And as a charity, I don't know of any better place if somebody's looking for, at the end of the year, somewhere to give. Last year, we operated on a budget of about $2 million. Our pilots donated over $8 million in like-kind donations. So I can literally tell people, and I don't know of any other charity that can do this, is we can 4X your investment into our charity. That donation that you give will be multiplied four to five times and affect the lives of hundreds of people. Man, <clears throat> you know, you and I haven't talked about this, but just hearing your story, when our oldest son, who's um, he's now 23, married, um, it's pretty, pretty cool, but he was our first kid and I, I'm 20. I'm 21 years old and we live in Elko, Nevada. And at 12 weeks in the womb, they find this, I won't go into the weeds on this, but they find a growth inside of him. And, you know, I'm making like 12 bucks an hour. Kara's not working and we'd have to go. They, they like wanted us to go to primary children's center, you know, once, once a month. And then as it progressed, like we're seeing a surgeon. And then as it gets closer to birth, like every week we're having to be there. And again, you know, Kara and I've said this so many times, like looking back, I don't even know how we made it. Um, you know, having to take that amount of work off. I didn't work for a company that I had vacation, any of the above. Right. And um, when he was, I was just thinking about the flight thing, because when he was getting ready to be born, they said this, you know, you cannot have this kid in Elko, Nevada. If you go into labor, you have to be on life flight. And I didn't have like life flight insurance or any of that stuff then. And I remember they tried to induce him. So we drove over to Salt Lake and it's a three and a half hour drive. And Ronald McDonald House is a um it's an it's a thing that we support now because if it hadn't been for Ronald McDonald House, I don't know how we would have survived um, you know, the overnight stays. And then when he ultimately yeah. had the surgery and everything else. And, you know, still to this day, we just it's on auto support, right? And when you go through something like that, it's just crazy. But anyway, they tried to induce him. So we drive over there and we're in the hospital for three days. This kid is like not coming. He's still that same, you know, you try to tell him what he's like, kind of like me. Actually, both of us are kind of stubborn, <laughs> me and Kara, but not coming, right? So they send us back home and they're like, listen, at the first sign of, you know, going into labor, like you have to, you cannot drive here if this kid is born because what they were worried about, he had a growth in his chest and they weren't so much worried about the mm. growth. They were worried about whether his lungs were going to be able to expand and if he could breathe. And they're like, your facility in Elko does not have what it needs to take care of this kid. And secondarily, you definitely don't want to have this on the highway. And I just remember thinking like, I mean, even at that point in time, what is a hundred and fifty or $200,000 flight going to do to me? And it doesn't matter right. when you're in those scenarios. You're, you know, like you said, with your wife or anything else. I mean, to, you're going to do what you have to do. But at the end of the day, it's those stressors. And I'm just thinking back, I didn't have the pilot network that I have now. Um, even yeah. in Elko, once I became a pilot, I mean, I could call 15 people that would fly us to Salt Lake, but I didn't have any of that then. And so to make a long story short, um, he ended up being born the next week and they didn't have to have surgery until he was two months old, but it was such a traumatic time for us. And I remember being in the hospital, Alan, and as bad as our situation was, there was a kid in the next room that had been there for 18 months, driving up 
from central Utah and his family would take turns like two times a week coming and staying with him. And I'm just like, as bad as our situation was, that whole experience made me realize that, you know, and I don't mean this in a, it just like, no matter how bad you think it is, there's people out there that have it worse and, and they're getting through it. And so I can too. Um, but knowing that your guys are doing what you're doing is just, I mean, you're, you're tugging on my heart here. It's pretty cool. Well, I, I love that you have a personal connection there. And if I was placing an order of charities that I love, Ronald McDonald House would be number two for me. We have cultivated a great relationship because there's so many families like yours that are traveling that end up being in a Ronald McDonald House where we can now relieve the burden of the travel. So now not only they're being taken care of while they're there and staying for however long that is, but now they don't have to worry about the travel. And, you know, we'll also fly caregivers or parents back and forth. So, you know, during that time period, if you'd had to be at work, we could have flown you back and forth to work. And the other part of what you said that really resonates is I tell people now I don't have bad days. I'm not 18 years old facing stage four cancer. You know, I'm not, you know, another, I just, the passengers that I've flown are rolling through my mind right now. And I, I can't get in my airplane and ever have a bad day again, because I mean, I've been there. I know what it feels like. You know what it feels like to have a rough spot in your life and a bad time. Um, but I really don't think I have that anymore. And that's not because my life is perfect. It's just because I've got some perspective that I didn't have before. And this service opportunity that I constantly put myself into reminds me of that all the time. So good. It's interesting because when you're talking about the miracles too, I'm I'm just thinking back, there was a family that was there and their daughter's name was Rebecca. I'll never forget these guys. But when, when we met them in the NICU after the surgery, um, Rebecca was actually laying in a bed with like thousands of tubes and cables and cords. And they actually had her chest packed with ice because she was like on her third open heart surgery and they could only go so far the day before. So they just kind of you know, they took her out and let her Left stabilize. It yeah, it was just crazy. But th Rebecca's parents said something. I don't remember their name, but I remember Rebecca's name. We have notes and cards and stuff for them. I should go look it up and get in touch with them. But they said something. They were talking about, you know, how challenging it is because it's like one of the only things health. Gosh, we just, that's like even, you know, back to the pillars of go abundance. Like it's the only thing that there's so many things that we can control. There's so many things that money can provide. There's so many things that, you know, as high performing entrepreneurs and business owners, and we take on more stress than, than most people ever will in their life. But when, it, when it's your kid or it's your own health or somebody like, it's the only thing that you're like, you, you just definitely need a miracle. And I remember handing Dylan over the, the, the doctors probably thought I was crazy because the day of the surgery, I'm like, I was believing for a miracle. And the day of the surgery, I asked the surgeon, I said, can we do one more MRI and just make sure that he's not healed? And <laughs> they kind of looked at me like I was nut. Um, and they're like, well, we can, if that's what you really want, it's going to be X amount of, you know, tens of thousands. I was just like, okay, do it. But I remember like talking to Rebecca's parents and they said, they were telling me this story out of the old Testament when Pharaoh was killing all the firstborn or, or I think all the males. And when Miriam took Moses and put him in the basket and put him into the, the river, I can't remember what river it was, but they put him in, she put him into the river and they're like, imagine, you know, you read these stories and they're like, imagine what Miriam was going through, knowing that she was putting her kid into the basket, putting it into the river. And then look what ended up happening. Like Pharaoh's daughter found Moses yeah. and, and liberated the, the Egyptians and all this stuff. And it kind of, it, it made me feel better in the sense that like, there's something bigger than me. And I've just thought that so many times thinking back to my kids or, you know, when there's a, a health issue in the family or anything you can't control, it's like, it's just, you got to put them in the basket. You got to put them in the river and you got to trust God. So it's like, as hard as these times are, they teach us these lessons that you'll, yeah, you know, I mean, you'll, you'll have for the rest of your life and it makes you stronger. Yeah. Every success that I'm enjoying in my life right now has a very direct connection to probably some of the worst challenges of my life. You know, the, the person that I am today, you know, prior to what I went through, um, if somebody told me they were dealing with depression or anxiety, I really thought that it was something people were making up, right? Like, hey, just get yourself out of bed and go to work. It's not that difficult until you become that. And now you're looking at yourself in the mirror and the pep talks don't work. And the, you know, you're just desperate for anything because for me, Mike, it was like, if all of my personality was, were breakers in a breaker box, it felt like somebody just turned them all off. 
and I wasn't an entrepreneur anymore. I wasn't athletic anymore. I wasn't creative anymore. You know, everything went away and I was faced with the very just the desperation of rediscovering who I was. And in that, there was a very real reaching out to a higher power. And at times that was really frustrating because I felt like, man, here I'm, you know, during this process post walking away from that business, I I probably opened or started three or four or five different businesses that when I started them, seemed like, oh yeah, this is going to be the thing. We're going to be back on track, and then it just wouldn't work out. And I had a got into a partnership where very experienced businessmen, um, and our our plan was a two billion dollar exit. And then he gets super sick and goes into the hospital, and literally is like in a coma for several months. And I in his recovery, I completely lose contact with him for like a year. And so there are all these things. But I'm at a place now where I can look back and see that the lessons that I learned in those, I won't even call them failures, but those lessons that I learned in those experiences provided all the skills and tools that I need right now to be doing. I couldn't be doing what I'm doing right now without having learned those lessons in what seemed like a failure at the time. I'm I'm so curious to kind of open this up and and ask you a question around this, but <clears throat> I talked to so many, you know, and, and you get into this too, and we see it in Go Abundance, um, ascend, emerge, and you know, talking to people along the way that think that you know their life sucks, their W two job sucks, even their business sucks. Then they it, it, like er, there's this ongoing conversation all the time where I feel like I'm always I'm always having the same. I feel like sometimes the tapes on replay where you're talking to someone and they're like, man, if I could just quit my job, or if I could just get 10 rentals, or if I could just get invested in 10 passive deals, or if I could just start my own business, or if I could just start my business and do something different, like everything's going to be so much better and I'll be happy. And I often say this, like things don't get easier. Like we just get better. And that's the theme that I'm hearing in your, in your message and your conversation here is like, sometimes it actually scares me because I'm like, I look backwards and I look at all the crap that I've been through and I'm like, Oh God, like, <laughs> you know, what's next. And and there's so many things out there, especially I think over the last 10 years where, you know, gurus and the self-development and all that's good, by the way, I think you should get educated. We should be in masterminds. We should be growing. But I think the message has been if you just quit your job, or if you just get investments, or if you just get enough passive income, and as Kiyosaki tells us, get out of the rat race, like everything's going to be okay. And on the other side of every single one of those conversations, or, you know, peaking a mountaintop are these valleys. And so I'm curious, you know, what are your thoughts on all of this? Because I think so many people think that if they could just, you know, get a raise, or if they could just do whatever, whatever it is that's on their list. And, and your list was like, I just need three miracles. Like, like legit yeah. miracles. What's your like? What's your take on that? Well, I think um, so. That's very different than what it is now. I think it's the difference between doing and being. Mike, yeah. When I was like 19 years old, I decided, hey, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 40. I had no idea really what that meant. I just knew that a million dollars was a lot of money. And 40 seemed like really old at the time. And I didn't know anybody that was young and had a lot of money. So I thought, okay, I can be can be old and have a lot of money. So that was the goal. But it wasn't because I wanted to be anything different. I didn't want to grow as a person. I just wanted to have. And the really big transition for me, I, you've probably read The Go-Giver. Um, but that was one of the huge shifts for me. Um, through this process was recognizing that, you know, what really needed to change is I needed to become the kind of person that could be entrusted with that kind of success. And what that meant is, for me, it was daily habits. Um, I, I set goals in a very specific way. I have, I have four whiteboards in my office. One of them is a three-year vision. One of them is a one-year vision. One of them is what am I going to do this month to move towards those visions. And the other one is the daily. And the way that I set those goals is I I divide when I'm making like an annual plan, uh, you know, my theme for the year or whatever, I divide that whiteboard into three columns. The first column is I am. The second one is I choose. And the third one is I feel. And so I decide in advance, um, like, Right now, I'm 
you know, the switch that's coming back on right now, Mike, is physical health. Um, I ignored that for several years trying to get my mental and emotional health back on track. Um, I flipped that switch now. So, you know, on that goal, it's I am healthy. I choose to eat and exercise in ways that promote physical and mental health. And I feel more attractive, more alive, more abundant. And so I'm tying my decisions today with the vision I have for myself in the future. And I'm telling myself how I'm going to feel as I make those decisions. And so I think that's a big part of, you know, to me, like the business I'm doing right now, that will come and go. But what's really important right now is becoming the type of person that no matter what the situation is, I know who I am, I know where I'm going, I know what I want to accomplish. And that for me has helped to tamper a lot of the downside when I'm starting to feel a little down or discouraged. You know, for me, starting a podcast this is a big deal. It's daunting. It feels huge. Um, and when I start feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the vision I have for myself, I just have to remind myself, no, I've already decided. I've decided what I'm going to do today. I've decided how I'm going to feel about it. I can quickly recover from those little downslides. And that's the biggest difference between today and, you know, maybe six, five, six years ago. So good. I, I remember when I was living in Elko, Nevada still, and I had a situation where I looked around and literally the next morning I'd gotten into a, like a argument with somebody that was always asking my opinion. And then we'd get into a fight. And the next morning I was thinking about that I think Jim Rohn originally said it, but you know, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, whatever. And I, so I started thinking about that and I started looking around at, you know, the people I was spending time with. And, and I, I made this list of, of new people that I wanted to, you know, get to know. And so I started talking to my wife about this list and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to become friends with these people. Cause I want to like up level my, you know, my five. And as I started working through that process, I realized like everybody on that list, I already knew and I wasn't hanging out with them. And so I was like, I realized that it wasn't really, everybody on that list was like a monetary stature. It was like a business type thing that I wanted to, but what I realized was like, again, back to like the different pillars. I'm like, if I wanted to hang out with these people, like I would be. And so back to the principle, like I had this epiphany a couple of years ago, everybody's always talking about, you know, increasing your average. Like, how do you, how do you become a better person? Get around five people that are better than you. But I remember one day as I was sitting and thinking about this and understanding when you talk about, you know, being instead of, um, you know, the, like, it's kind of like the be, do, how or have the idea of being, I started asking myself the question, okay, if I want to get around five people that are going to up my average, who do I have to become in order for those people to let me in their world? Because we're always so like centered and sighted on what we want. And so we're looking for five people that are above us. And this is how I feel when I walk into a GoBundance room, like still to this day, everybody has this feeling, but it's like, okay, I'm going to get around people that are better than me. But when I shifted the idea around when you talk about being like this, you know, how, how do you become a better version of, of, of Mike? That's, that's when it became really clear to me that it isn't about like, why would those people let, if they're at an average of eight and I'm a six, like, why would those guys let me drag them down? And so when I really started working on myself, first and foremost, it kind of shifted my thinking about that. But I think a lot of people think that the easy button is, you know, just get around people that are more successful or more fit or more whatever, but really like, it's about us changing who we are. And so I love the way that you frame that around, you know, it's moving into a being attitude or mindset, right? And I would add to that, I, what do I need to become to be comfortable in their company, but also what can I give? And that, mm -hmm. that actually for me, Mike, was one of the hardest things when I joined GoBundance. Now, maybe my, I don't know, what your story for joining GoBundance is, but I, I literally, I read Hal Elrod's book on the Miracle Morning Millionaire. Then I read The Tribe of Millionaires. And then I joined. I'd never met anybody. When I joined, it was kind of in that transition period of leadership. And I didn't, I, I literally, I got an invoice and I got a, an invite to the website where I found where the local meeting was going to be. And I showed up not having met anyone there. And it was incredibly intimidating because I had just come from the worst place of my life. I had just walked away from this huge business. And I had, I thought that these guys were, they all flew in on their private jets and they all had life figured out. They're all going to be super fit. I didn't know what to wear. I was pretty sure I was going to get kicked out of the room when I walked in. And so like the biggest shock of my life was to realize that, oh, these guys have gone through difficult things too. And But where I'm going with that is I, I left that meeting asking myself, what can I give here? 
I know what I can get. That was very clear. There's a lot that I can gain from being in that room, but I don't want to be a getter. So what can I, what is unique about me? What, what qualities, what talents do I have? What advice can I give? What experience can I share? Um, and that, that's where aviation became super cool because I was something that nobody else in that room was. I was a pilot. And so it, my entry became, hey, I love flying to Sedona. Would you like to come with me and fly to Sedona? Now, that may have been the only thing that I had to offer, but it was unique and it was something that I could give. Now, I've learned now uh, enough love for myself to recognize that there's more to me to give. But at the time, I was just grasping for straws. That was that was the one straw that I had. Um, but you don't need a lot to set yourself apart, but you do need will be willing to share it and to be genuinely interested in what you can give to people in a room so that you don't show up as a guy that's just trying to, to get something from everybody else. You know, it's such an amazing, <clears throat> when I hear that and mirror back, you said you joined a year ago. This was like a year ago. Yeah. So a year ago, October. When I mirror that back, um, it's just so powerful for the audience that's listening. Like, I think sometimes people think that, you know, these exponential moments in our life where we get, you know, some, some free uplift from, from the wind. Um, I think a lot of times people think that this is, you know, a five year, 10 year, 20 year process, but you know, when you find your community and you get your head right. And I mean, it's amazing. Like I, I, the way that you interact and engage at GoBundance and, um, I would have thought you'd been in there for 10 years. Right. And so when you find your tribe or your place or your community, so again, for the audience, if, if you're searching or looking like whether it's a GoBundance or a local community or what, even if it's just a church community, like get plugged in, because I think a lot of times when we're in our lowest points, and I don't know if you've found this, but I think the natural tendency for humans is to bury our head in the dirt and to try to hide our problems. And in reality, what we need to do to pull ourselves out of that funk is to just accept number one, what you already said, like everybody's got their shit, man. Like we're all dealing with stuff, right? And, and just lay it out there. And this is what I love about. So my journey with GoBundance, I just realized the year that I found GoBundance, same book, uh, Miracle Morning for Millionaires, I was just coming out of a real estate mastermind, focused on money, focused on growth. And I told my wife, I said, I want to find a community that makes me a better man, like a better person. And I had just read Miracle Morning for Millionaires, but I, the GoBundance thing obviously didn't click because he doesn't talk about it in there, David Osborne, the founder. And when I told my wife that the next morning, she sent me a link to GoBundance. Oh, and wow. she's like, have you ever heard of this community? Like I it just popped up in my feed or something. And I was like, no. And I watched the video and it's David Osborne, right? Yeah. And so for me, like I was looking for authentic relationships with men. Um, I had a dad that was, you know, absent in my life and my mom was the strong figure. And then my grandma raised me and I got married at an early age. And so what I kind of realized was like, I didn't know how to have real authentic relationships with men. And in this day and age, and we kind of touched on it in the beginning, I don't think most men know how to, because we're taught yeah. to be tough and it's bravado and it's competition. And it's, it's not about feelings and being open and transparent. And, and so again, for the audience, and I'd love to hear your take on that. If you're in a place where, you know, you're lacking that, that, that could be the one thing that pulls you or Alan or me or anybody else out of your dark spot is being vulnerable and authentic and finding the people that will accept you as you are. And it's scary as hell, right? Yeah. I have, I have two comments on that. The first one is I love the connection to, you never know how close you are to things turning around. So, you know, I'm working right now on a, on a $200 million business. That's my vision in three years, which is, you know, like 13 times the size of the biggest thing that I've ever done. And in less than a quarter of the time frame. And as I was writing out these goals for myself, there's this huge moment of fear, like, dude, you're not the guy that can do this. Like, it took you 13 years to get to $16 million a year. You know, how is that even possible? And then immediately right after that, I thought, you know, the version of Alan today didn't know the growth that was going to come from joining a community a year ago. And that version of Alan didn't know the growth and development and happiness that would come from being a pilot. It was that Alan three years ago never could have imagined any one of those things, never could have imagined becoming a pilot, never could have imagined joining a community that would change his life, never would imagine a partnership that's growing the largest vision, you know, this huge vision. And, and so 
you know, the advice that I give my kids now is, you know, I know it's hard right now, but from where I'm sitting, I can see that you're not very far from it getting really good. And you, you just have to learn the lessons in that tough place and it'll all work out okay. The second thing, Mike, is actually a question because you've, you've talked about your wife a lot. And candidly, I've admired the relationship that you have with your wife from a distance. We've never, we've never really spoken in person before, I don't think, but I've seen that example from you. The question I had as you were talking about vulnerability is how has learning how to be vulnerable with men and have an authentic relationship with other men change the relationship that you have with your wife? Is that, or what did you, that already exist? And, you know, how has it improved or changed? Yeah, that's interesting. I think uh, it's, it's obviously improved. I've learned how to communicate my feelings more. Um, Cause that's one thing that I don't <laughs> think I ever really knew how to do. Um, nope. <laughs> yeah, so that that's probably the biggest thing because when you're able to, you know, communicate openly, and this is a generalized statement, but when you're able to communicate openly and be emotional and transparent and vulnerable with men, I think it becomes easier with women. And and maybe that's just for me, but and and man, maybe that's true because being surrounded by strong women in my life, my mom, my grandma, and then ultimately my wife, um I think there was a part of me as a man that um, was softer already. So I think I think part of it was already true. I, I think just communicating primarily with the most important women in my life taught me to communicate. But then being able to do that with men, I think makes you a better communicator even with women because they're more you know feeling oriented, communication oriented, um, et cetera. So when you learn to do that with men, I think it becomes easier to do it with women. And maybe it's just, maybe it doesn't really have anything to do with men or women and just learning to truly be vulnerable. But um, yeah, if I had to narrow it down to that, it's probably the it's probably the vulnerability piece, just uh, learning to be open and honest about how you feel. And I think so many times as humans, but men specifically, um, we're scared of, you know, what when we when we voice our feelings, um, we're we're scared of we're scared of being judged or um, you know, being being weak. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way yeah. to put it for sure. So I think my mom, my, my grandma, who are both really tough women, my wife is a lot more tender. She's tough as nails too, but, um, I think she's taught me probably more than I could have ever taught her. And, um, but yeah, I think just getting around men has made it easier for sure. And I, I would say for me that probably at the heart of most of the challenges that I faced with grief and depression was because I didn't know how to deal with emotion before that. When on my path to success through several successful businesses and stuff, when emotion came up, I would just stuff it because it, it got in the way of doing what I was trying to do. And that's been one of the greatest lessons that I've learned over the last couple of years, especially within the last year, has been that if I have emotion, it's not good or bad. It's just an emotion. But if I can share it, especially with my wife, that's opened up levels of intimacy and vulnerability and love that we didn't share before because I didn't know how to express it. I was afraid that if I felt scared or sad or discouraged, that that meant that I was weak. And if I was weak, I would not be desirable. And if I wasn't desirable, I was really in trouble because I knew that she could go find somebody more desirable. That's never been a question. Uh, and so learning that that vulnerability isn't weakness to her. It's just intimacy. And I love, she and I were discussing the other day, she found a definition for the word intimacy that literally means into me see. So mm -hmm. when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, we're allowing our, our spouse, our partner, our friend to see into us. And that also invites them to be comfortable enough to allow us to see inside of them. And that's where I think that true friendship, you know, I was making a list on Thanksgiving. In fact, I was I pulled my hamstring playing football with my voice and uh, had a bunch of time on my hand. And I thought, you know, I'm not just going to sit here and let it get cold and painful. I'm going to go for a walk. And as I was walking, I was like, who who do I need to tell that I'm grateful for them? And as I went through that, I realized in the past year, all of my closest relationships have been guys that whose life uh, an example or their words uh, have touched me or I've been able to have some kind of influence in their life. And so I spent the next hour or so just doing quick video messages of gratitude. I would say probably 90% of those guys were guys that I didn't know a year ago that we met 
through this community of go abundance it's been a, an amazing experience so powerful um real quick do you have a hard stop at one i don't think so okay i don't either <laughs> I, I, we got we have four minutes and i don't want to just like <laughs> just we're good it, we're good just, okay um all right so you know when you were when you were saying that I'm thinking back to something that you were talking about with your daughter, and we obviously experienced this with our son. And when we're talking about just even being open in communication, my my wife's a breathwork facilitator. And for the audience, I don't know if you've done breathwork, but um, when she was first going, yeah, it's amazing. And for the audience that hasn't tried it or you're scared of it or whatever, um, I was a drug addict back in the day. And, <laughs> you know, so I've, I'm pretty hesitant, like, you know, what I get involved in and outside. What I love about breath work, though, is it's you and it's you alone. And maybe you're with a facilitator, um, but I've had experiences in breath work that I never had when I was doing, you know, LSD or shrooms or any of the things that I did back in the day. But the reason why I bring that up is when Kara was going through certification on breathwork facilitation, she showed me this video of a gazelle that had been attacked by a lion. And when the gazelle got away, which it did, um, it started shaking and, and releasing trauma. And we're not designed when we go through traumatic experiences to not talk about it or to not let it out, to not release that trauma. And when you're talking about your daughter and you know not being able to sleep, and we noticed with our son he was very, um, as I mean, he's a very loving person and open, just the greatest guy you'll ever meet. But when he was younger, he was very protective. He wasn't very open. Like he wouldn't open himself up to people very often. And, and we really realized, you know, through some conversations with people and stuff that when people go through traumatic experiences, like they did, I mean, he was two months old and we think that that stuff doesn't impact him, but there was, you know, as a little baby, like he had no idea what was going on. And, and there was just people left and right touching him and cutting on him and and that stuff affects us and so just bringing it back to us like and men in general like if we don't learn to communicate communicating is one way to release trauma um and there's many other ways obviously counseling and breath work and you know ayahuasca journeys if that's what yeah. you're into i'm i'm not <laughs> but i'm not opposed to it I just, again, because my background, I don't do it, but I don't think that we're designed to hold that trauma in. And in this day and age, I don't think, I don't think that most of us have the community like you and I have, um, or the yeah. spouse relationship, et cetera, to where we can communicate. And I think that communicating about your emotions is trauma release number one. And it's the best, it's the biggest way to also hold all that in. Because I mean, if you talk to anybody that's, you know, getting a divorce or they don't get along or whatever, they're just, they probably haven't been communicating for years. And there's just layers and layers and layers of trauma. And when people think trauma, I think they think things like you're talking about. Trauma can be, I got in a fight yesterday with somebody that I love. And I think it's such an important thing that you're talking about. Just being able that in, into me see, it's, it's, yeah. it's so important. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm so excited to hear that your wife does breath work. Uh, uh, I, I had never done breath work until uh, the event in, in Atlanta and doing that with Ryan Kennedy, and then again in Florida a couple of weeks ago. And those two experiences had a dramatic effect on me. So speaking to that trauma, I think there's stages of release, right? Like I, I met with grief counselors, I learned how to fly airplanes, I've developed meditation practices and, and other things that have helped me to move. And one of the challenges I felt like I was facing is I was holding on to a ton of anger from especially from the loss of my dad, I just felt like that was one blow too many that God gave me at that time. And on the day that he died, I was in my truck, driving back and forth in front of the church that my family and I go to, swearing at the top of my lungs at God. I was so angry. Um, and I realized, and this is very fresh, Mike, like within the last couple of months, that that anger was preventing me from becoming who I wanted to become. And I didn't know how to move past it um, and had no concept of breath work. I was looking at different counseling options to see how I could move that out. So we go to this event and Ryan starts talking and he says, you know, it's okay if, if you cry. And, and I was like, what are you talking about? We're just, I thought it was like, we're doing yoga or something. I'm like, why in the world would we be crying? What are we even... Um, but through that experience and that, that guided experience with him, that, that ball of anger moved and was completely removed. 
and which has allowed me now to accept other things in my life and to move forward. And I don't think it matters what the mechanism is, but identifying what that trauma is within us um, and then finding ways to move it through can be so powerful. You know, as an entrepreneur, as a father, as a husband, I can't afford to be less. One of the big lessons from my dad, my dad was 66, Mike, so he was young. I, I looked up and I was 43 at the time. And I thought, wow, um, what if I only get to do 23 more summer vacations with my family? What if I only get 23 more Christmases with them? What if there's only 23 more birthdays or anniversaries or whatever the event is? And I realized I just I couldn't afford to keep living life the way that I had been and that I needed to change. And so even though that period of loss and depression and walking away from a, a tremendously profitable business was without a doubt the most difficult period of my life, uh, it allowed me to become who I am today because it forced me to change. I, I couldn't do life in the same way. And I have people all the time that work with me that will call and say, hey, are you ready to get back into the business? And I can't do it. You know, I could go. I, I know how to do the business, but I can't go back to being that person. And just like, you know, I think drugs and alcohol, I don't know what it, what it was for you, but I think because we don't know how to deal with emotion in a healthy way, we find things. For me, I was a workaholic. So, you know, I didn't do drugs or anything else, but I found another way to to suppress emotion and to hide my feelings. And learning how to overcome those things really unlocks power and potential in people's lives and and the course to real fulfillment and happiness, I believe. So good. So good. You know, the problem with guys like you is I could probably do a five hour podcast with you. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're just going to have to fly in somewhere and sit down and have a, bring our wives with us and we'll enjoy a weekend together and just unpack life. We, I was thinking earlier, this was early in the conversation, but it would be fun to get in the plane and, and record a podcast in the air. That would be fun. Um, it's actually on my show. Uh, one of the goals is to make, you know, maybe two out of every 10 episodes will be from the cockpit. I'll just put on the autopilot and and record a solo episode. Yeah, I think doing a Zoom call or something like that could be challenging with signals and whatnot, but doing a solo recording is definitely feasible. So that that is something that I'm going to be doing. Well, let's shift to that. Let's talk about plane success because I'm excited about this. So what is it? You've you've touched on it a little bit, but I'm what is it? Where is it? When when's it launching? Yeah. So plane success is was an idea for a podcast that showed up about a year ago, maybe probably just after joining GoBundance. And uh, I put it on my vision board and I pulled it down several times. It kept coming back. Um, and ultimately for me, what it comes down to is I thought, you know, there was an experience that I had. Uh, it was at a convention in Las Vegas with a friend. His name's Johnny. And th this was for setting up an investment fund. And so you can imagine in a room like that, how people show up dressed, business casual, you're in sports coats or button down shirts. And that's how I was dressed, just like everybody else. And then Johnny walks in and he's wearing pink workout shorts, pink shoes, pink socks, pink shirt, and a pink headband. And I thought he had just come from the gym or something. So I walked up and I'm kind of laughing to myself. I'm like, oh, this guy looks like an idiot. And uh, I said, Johnny, um, you know, did you wake up late? Like, welcome to the conference. And he kind of looks around the room and he goes, Alan, who do you think people are going to remember today, me or you? And I thought, this guy's got it. He found something to shine in that environment. Now, I'm not going to advocate showing up in pink gym shorts and pink shirts into a convention. I, I couldn't, I don't know that I could pull that off, but plain success for me is an acknowledgement both of my journey and what aviation has done for me, what using that skill and that joy that I've received to give to other people has done for me. But also, I love connecting with entrepreneurs. I love connecting with people that have experienced some measure of success in their life, not because I think they're better than other people or anything else, but I, I know what it takes to achieve at that level. And so it's, it's another community for me where I can find genuine connection with guys and girls who are enjoy the same experiences, who have the same love of a hobby. You know, people I get invited to go golfing all the time. 
And I just, you know, I can let people know I can only afford one expensive hobby at a time. And so I've chosen aviation. So plane success maybe is a selfish venture where, you know, I just get to spend time with people that I would want to spend time with and, and learning cool stories. But the other thing is, is I think when I look at myself, there was no reason really from the age of 21 or 22 to the age of 43 or 44 that I shouldn't have pursued the dream that I had. But I didn't allow myself to do it. I, I suppressed that dream and that vision. And I hope that in sharing the joy that other people have for aviation, if there's a little boy or a little girl out there like me who has loved planes and aviation, that they can be inspired to do something that, that they would love to do. And I hope I can inspire other pilots with the charity that I represent. They don't have to fly for Angel Flight West, but take that skill, take that advantage that life has given you, that God has given you, and use it to bless the lives of others and see how that, you know, I, I love to say that there's no such thing as a life changing experience or a life changing conversation. There's only lives changing experiences or lives changing conversations because we can't measure the effect that that's going to have. I have a 21 year old son now that's in flight school trying to be an airline pilot. Two years ago, would he have chosen that? Probably not. But now he saw his dad doing something that dad loves to do. He's been able to experience it and he's found something he loves to do. So it's changed the course of his life. Um, I don't know what kind of effect that will have on other people's lives, but that's that's what plain success for is for me is an opportunity to share the miracles that I've received, the miracle of happiness, the miracle of prosperity, and the miracle of purpose. So that's what plain success is. So good. You know, we talked about the generosity in go abundance and in you know most wealthy people in general. But when you the one thing that I realized in the pilot community, they are some of the most gen genuine, like generous, like it's the, one of the most helpful, the private pilot community is like one of the most helpful communities that exists. And so as you're sharing that and you're talking about plane success, I'm really excited to see the opportunities that that opens up obviously for you, um, but for other people as well, because again, that community is so open and generous and helpful, but it's also like localized for the most part, right? Like you got your little yeah. communities everywhere, but it's going to be really cool to see like, you know, where that goes that you may or may not even be thinking about over time because that community is just pretty amazing. The other thing that I wanted to say is you're talking through that too. You know, you're talking about hopefully inspiring people to chase their dreams. If there's one thing that being a pilot has taught me about me, there's not a lot of areas in my life that I have fear. I grew up in a very, you know, mm. volatile fam. Like I didn't, there was not a lot of like, there was not a lot of like consistency or I learned to not be scared at an early age. There's pretty much nothing that you could put in front of me that I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. But I can't tell you how many times I wanted to quit being a pilot because I'm like, I don't know if I can trust myself or in an emergency or <laughs> so like it's brought out a whole other version of me that taught me to conquer another level of fear in myself that I, because I don't know if most of the time we really have ours and everybody else's life in our hand and, you know, including yeah. everybody that's on the outside. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, I love that you mentioned that because, you know, that's something that always is front of mind, at least for me. You know, I, I, I don't know the size of your family. I have eight kids. So I know that every time I get in that plane, that if I'm not performing at the highest level that I can, that I could do something or not do something that would have a really detrimental effect on, on their life. You know, I, I, I lost a dad, but I was an adult. I can't imagine what that would be like as a kid. That does make you face some of those fears. But I also think that's why the joy is heightened also, because um, you're facing that fear, that challenge. And choosing to do things that allow you to overcome that. Yeah. When we were talking about, you know, the average of the five people, like you're just increasing your own average. Like there's nobody, you're not competing against anybody up there. It's like, you're just becoming a better version of yourself constantly. It's pretty wild. It's, it's my happy place. If I am feeling discouraged or, you know, if I just need to think there's for me, no better place than sitting behind, you know, sitting in the cockpit and, just spinning around in the sky a little bit to let my head clear. And obviously you get above the ground. It provides a different perspective of the world. It both, I think, helps you to see how small you are 
and your problems, but it also is a really powerful feeling. So it allows me to feel how powerful I am and what the potential is because now new horizons open up, you know, from, from where I'm at, if, if I'm standing on the ground at the airport, I can't see Sedona, I can't see Flagstaff, but I don't have to get very high in the air before I can see Sedona and Flagstaff. And I think that is one of the greatest blessings for me that aviation has brought is just perspective is again, going back, the goals that you have for yourself, the dreams that you have, no matter how hard it is right now, they're really not that far away. You gain a little bit of altitude and all of a sudden the sky clears and you can see where you want to go and, and you can get there. What's your tail number? 998 Lima Tango. 998 nine, nine, nice. Lima Tango. Yeah. Okay. So that's, nine, that's nine, the current tail number. I like it. 998 Lima Tango, you're cleared to land. Let's talk about your fund. And okay. Then why don't you tell us where people can find you, plane success, access to the fund, anything else? Let's bring it home. Yeah, so, okay, we'll do it. So we, we, my partner and I, are inviting investors to join with us in what I think is really the future of housing in America. Um, out, out, outside of mobile home parks, just kidding. Outside <laughs> of mobile home parks, yes. But yeah, we want to make sure that's clear. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, if it's not in mobile home parks, then the next future in America <laughs> is ADUs or additional dwelling units. And California recently passed legislation where any home in California can be converted from a single home into a threeplex. In San Diego, they're so desperate for housing that any home can literally be converted into anything you want if you purchase the right property and know how to navigate that. So we have a property right now that's walking distance to USD that is a single family home surrounded by apartments that will become a seven play. And the math is super simple. Uh, we can build a unit for $200,000 and that unit is then worth somewhere between 650,000 or a million dollars per unit. So the real trick is, do you know the market? Do you know the process? Do you have the people in place to do it? We've figured that out. Uh, and so, you know, right now, uh, even our lowest tier investor, we're estimating returns in 18 to 20 months of about 50% on their money. It's backed by real estate. So we know that uh, there's very little downside risk. Uh, San Diego is a unique market. You have all five military branches there, plus their contractors, plus their vendors. So the rental market is strong. There's 17 renters for every rental property in San Diego. They don't have any land where they can go and build big developments like they can in Phoenix or places in Texas. Uh, so it's a really, and they've got a Mediterranean climate. So it's a really unique market with a really unique investment idea. Uh, you can find us at uh, mmtmgrp.com. Uh, it's Momentum Group. Uh, or you can look at uh, you know us on social, Momentum Capital, or me and see what we're doing. They can reach out to me personally. That's, uh, I love sharing what we're doing because it, to me, it's an opportunity. There's a lot of people that are investing with me that, you know, maybe just got hammered in the stock market, lost a bunch of money. And so again, it's another, I see it. Yeah. There's a great upside for me when it works, but it's a really great opportunity. This is something I love about the fund structures. I get to take something that I'm passionate about that I'm a, an expert in and share it with someone else and allow them to change their financial future. Yeah. It's curious. Um, I was just, it, when you take like a single family and you turn it into a seven unit, like the financing gets better too, right? Yeah. So you go from residential financing to commercial financing. So now you're dealing with cap rates or multiples of the rental. Um, that's another advantage we have there also, Mike, is if you are a multifamily investor and you are looking to buy property in San Diego, that property is subject to uh, rental caps so uh, or rent controls, but new construction is exempt for 15 years. Wow. So when we build a fourplex or fiveplex or a sixplex, it's a premium property in that market because landlords, investors know that they can raise rents at market rate and they're not subject to that cap on their rental increases for the next 15 years. So it's a huge investment opportunity also. 
And just for the audience, is this for accredited investors only or are you taking some non-accredited? Or So this fund is accredited only. We're exploring the option of non-accredited. We've had a lot of interest. There's a lot of nuance in that decision. Uh, some of it is uh, with it, when we're dealing with accredited investors, it's a smaller number of investors that we're having to deal with. And there's some advantages that we can advertise to and things like that. My motivation on the non-accredited side is I have a lot of friends and family members who could really benefit from this. And so we're, we're exploring as a group what that might look like in another offering uh, early next year. Cool. And tax benefits, um, obviously it's real estate. So the tax benefits are part of it, depreciation, et cetera. Yeah, but this is what's so cool is we get to do depreciation benefits twice. So when we purchase a million dollar home, you do a cost segregation on that, you're going to wind up with a whole bunch of tax savings, you know, because the land value is maybe 300,000 or something. But then when we construct the new ADUs, the entire cost of that construction is a new cost segregation. So we get to do a cost seg twice on the same property. Wow. So that's really, I mean, obviously when you said the returns, like I get it because it's in areas that need a lot of housing, but also the depreciation benefit, man, that's crazy. That's awesome. Yeah. And those returns are absent of depreciation benefits and we haven't calculated into that any appreciation in the market. And San Diego is expected to have a price increase of 10% over the next year, even where maybe most of the rest of the country is anticipated to decline or stay flat. So I did what Tower does often. I told you you could land and then I made you go around. So um, you made me go around. <laughs> um, so Alan, this has been fantastic. I kept you longer than I should have. Um, where can people find you if they're interested in just reaching out or plane success or uh, Angel Flight West? or your fund? Yeah, so angelflightwest.org, I'll, I'll promote them first. Uh, if they're, if you know somebody who's having to travel a long distance, more anything more than an hour really to get healthcare, or maybe they have a family member who's receiving healthcare, um, angelflightwest.org is any of the 13 Western states. Um, if you're outside of the 13 Western states, we have sister organizations that operate nationwide. So anywhere in the country, we can help. Uh, we can direct you to the right place. It's pretty easy to find me on social media. I think both LinkedIn and Instagram are the Alan Underwood. Uh, Plain Success is also on Instagram and Facebook. You can find me there. Uh, you can reach me at Alan, A-L-A-N, at planesuccess.com. That's my email. I'm happy to receive anybody there and speak about airplanes or investments or whatever that is. Or even if somebody's going through a tough time and they need to talk to somebody who's been through that fire. That was one of the biggest things for me is coming out of that. Is And there's so many other people that are going through it that I just need to walk back in and help them out. Yeah. So powerful. Well, I appreciate your time. Any final words that we didn't get to cover that you want to share? Oh, I think we're going to have opportunities in the future to cover any of those final words, Mike. I'm looking forward to those conversations too. Cool. Appreciate it, brother. 